probably not more than maybe 300 people if that. As such, in a small village and anyone who is from a rural community has to know that when you are in that small of community, everybody knows everybody, right? Most likely in Nazareth, they might have all been related some way or another. But in any event, when that community gathered together, nothing passed them by. Probably by now on this Sabbath evening when the synagogue was maybe not, maybe even smaller than this space here, that the whole community would gather. And in the way that the whole community gathered, whispers went around all of them. You know, one of our own. He's been doing things outside of our village that is just amazing. He changed water into wine. He's begun to heal people. It's just, have you, do you know that? And so whispers went around. And so when they heard that Jesus was going to appear that evening in their synagogue, they were very excited. They wanted to know more about him. But to be honest with you, as we will hear next week, so you have to come back next week to know what else is said, right? But I'll, I'll give you a preview. When you're in that kind of community and everybody knows you, the expectations placed upon you are very different. I'll put it this way, and this is something I probably should keep for next week, but I'll say it now. My home parish, my home church in St. Louis, it was a, a smaller uh, Catholic uh, parish. And uh, they knew that I had, was a seminarian, that I was in seminary studying to be a priest. And so I had the opportunity, the pastor gave me the opportunity to preach one Sunday. Now this was unheard of for a non-ordained, I was a deacon, but it was unheard of for a non-priest to preach that many years ago. And so when I got up to preach, I looked out on the congregation and there was my third grade teacher and my fourth grade nun. And of course my mom sitting in the second row because we were front row Catholics, not back row Catholics. And there were quite a number of people from the neighborhood that I had grown up in. Needless to say, when you preach in front of family, as many of you have done here, right? Uh, when you preach in front of family, it's, it's very, um, it, it increases the level of anxiety and concern. To this day, I do not remember what I preached on or what the text was. Perhaps because I was so nervous and anxious about it that I blocked it out of my mind. In any event, when I got done uh, with the sermon and we were leaving church, I said to my mom, well, what did you think? She said, I didn't think you had it in you. I looked at her and I said, what? Now, later on, I realized that all of the people out there knew all of my story. They knew the time that I had gotten kicked off the school bus for fighting. Uh, my mother remembered the day that I skipped school by climbing under the forsythia bush in the front yard. She remembered the times that I got called to the principal's office. And so why not say what she said? Gee, you surprised me. You said things that I didn't think you even cared about, believed, thought about, or understood. And there I was in the pulpit preaching to everyone that I knew. So this is going to be a part of this story. But in any event, as Luke tells it, that Jesus goes into the synagogue and everybody's watching him, right? Again, when you're well-known in the community, everybody's going to watch you, right? It's like I remember in one of the churches where I were at, 
we frequently got uh, the coach of the Cardinals. Uh, even one time the governor showed up because it was actually his parish. Nancy Pelosi showed up one Sunday because she had grandchildren in the parish. So when you know there are important people in the congregation, you either decide to ignore that, preach to them, meaning you're going to get the chance to say things to them that you need to say to them that they need to hear. So everybody's watching Jesus. And he's handed the scroll. And it's a very interesting way that Luke tells the story. It's called the chiasm. And in Greek, a chiasm is, it, it's sort of like this. You go A, B, C, B, A. So that the C is the middle piece that really is the important part of what you've got to pay attention to. So he stands up, handed the scroll, he unrolls the scroll. If you go after the reading, after the little text that he reads, he rolls back the scroll, he gives it back to the attendant, and he sits down. So we're asked to pay attention to the Isaiah reading in the middle. Now, this Isaiah reading comes from chapter 61 in the prophet Isaiah. And in the context of Isaiah, it actually comes from a time when the Israelites had returned from exile and had high hopes that everything that they had before exile would be restored to them. That the kingship would be restored, that their prosperity would be restored, that they would be sitting on top of the world because that's what the prophets before them had said, right? Every mountain will be made low and every valley will be filled in and the way will be made easy for you. It will be a wonderful time. The great wedding feast that we heard a little bit about last week. It will be a time of glory, of majesty. Well, frankly, what happened is they get back, they're still under the domination of the Persians, and life is the pits. All of the infrastructure had been destroyed, and their temple had been destroyed. Life was awful for them. And so it would come, it would be like, wow, how, what's up, what is this all about? Almost as if to say to God, God, what's up with this? You promised us glory. And if this is glory, wow, we don't know what else would be here. And so the prophet, or God, speaks through the prophet. Now, this is the problem. And the problem has to do with often thinking that not only these scriptures, but our relationship with God only involves spiritual things. In other words, often Christians think, you know, we have to suffer in this world and we just have to put up with it in this world. And hopefully we live a good life because when we get to heaven, then we'll really have everything. So it's always future directed. It's never in the present moment. Life is the pits here. Just hope that you live a good life and God will reward you with heaven afterwards. Often it becomes spiritual. The harsh reality is that neither the biblical vision nor the activity of God has to do with only spiritual things. It's always about physical reality. And the physical realities has to do with how we live in the world. Not only how we live in the world with each other, but how are we going to live in the world with all those other people out there around us who don't believe as we believe? And remember, when the Israelites come back from exile, they're a small community living in the midst of an even more diverse reality of Judea and Israel. That not only are there Greeks now living in their midst, but there are Persians living in their midst. There are Canaanites, and you can go through the list. Canaanites, Pezites, Pezites. You just go on with all kinds of ites. And so here they are in a very different world than what they had left several generations before. So that makes it even more complicated. We could close ourselves off and live in a small little community totally uninterested in the politics of the world around us, 
struggle as best as we can under an economic system that the Persians have imposed, we can do that. But the question that is raised through this text in Isaiah in chapter 61 is that maybe if we take a passive view of God, and lots of our spirituality is that way, just pray to God and God will take care of it. Turn it over to God and God will make it happen. Offer it up to God and God will respond. Right, we're told in, in, the, in our tradition, right? Pray to God and God will hear your prayer and God will take care of your needs. Sometimes you have to wonder how long do we have to wait? And I often say in prayer that maybe if I spoke Hebrew, God would understand because God doesn't seem to get the English. Right? Isn't that true sometimes? And so in this text in Isaiah, the invitation that God is making through Isaiah is for the community to understand that it can't take a passive, a it can't take a passive, it can't be passive in the face of the world in which they're living. They can't passively say, God, you need to take care of this and then do nothing. You can't take the passive position that everything is expected of God and little is expected of the individual or the community even more. And so the invitation made in Isaiah is to understand that the community is to be the agents, the physical agents and instruments of what God intends for the world. That God's not going to make peace without us actively engaged in practices of peacemaking. That God is not going to feed the hungry and clothe the naked without us being actively engaged in feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. That's a part of the beauty of the, the parable of the leaven, right? That now there's more. And I remember last year was the first time I'd ever baked in heaven. And it was like, I'm not good at following directions or reading directions. And so when I tried to make bread and following the direction, and after I got the yeast, the leaven, and I did all of this, and you set it aside for a while, and about an hour or so later, I came back and I went, wow, look at that. It actually worked. And I remember then finally getting the dough and the wonderful smell of the bread baking in the oven and pulled it out and went, wow, look at that. It actually worked. I actually made bread. And then when you cut it for the first time and you taste it, you go, wow, it actually tastes good. I was so surprised at myself that I had made something that I had never done before and that all of those images, right, of the love and, and, and expect, and wow, and you see a part of it was that my God for two people, what I had made out of the recipe was good enough for five people. Thankfully, with the freezer, I put some in the freezer, right? So the next time I did it was when we had a dinner party. There were six more people at dinner with us, and I got smart this time, and I made little loads so that each person had their own. See, part of it is that it's not just for us that we do things. It's so that others may benefit from it. And when you have least in the scarcity, then you don't think of others. You only think of yourself. But in this now vision of God, there's going to be more than we could ever imagine so that everyone has what they need and it comes by way of us willing to share it. So God, you can do what you do, but if we're not going to be the ones helping this out, then it's not going to happen. So Jesus rolls up the scroll, gives it back and he says, this is fulfilled in your hearing. And that's as far as I'm going to go with that because next week we'll hear what happens with that. So again, you all have to come back next week to find out how the story concludes. Well, what is this about? 
the last phrase, and the translation doesn't quite say it, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Well, what this is actually about is the great jubilee. And the jubilee in the ancient tradition was a time when, well, it's sort of like going on sabbatical or taking not a vacation, but a jubilee in, in the biblical tradition, as it's said in Leviticus and the book of Deuteronomy, is that you use your field seven years and then you let your field fly follow for seven years. Why? Well, they were smarter than we are, and it took through going through the Dust Bowl in our country to figure out that if you keep using the resources of the earth till there's no more nutrients in the earth, it's not going to be good anymore. And so the ancient peoples understood this. So you give jubilee to the land. Let the land rest so that it has time to replenish itself. Let yourselves rest. It's interesting that in the story, you harvest crops for seven months or seven years. Notice how seven, remember how the other biblical text, how the question came to Jesus, how much should I forgive? Seven times, 70 times. So that seven months, seven years, 70 years, it's a huge number. So the, the jubilee means that what we do is not to continue to hoard and use and abuse and use it till there's no more nutrients in it, but rather we give ourselves, we liberate ourselves from the need to acquire and achieve and accomplish and the, the thought of needing to always get ahead and be ahead of everybody else. We liberate ourselves from that so that now in the freedom of Jubilee, we can pay attention to what really matters. And what's going to really matter is where in our lives do we need healing? Where in our lives do we need to find wholeness again? Where in our lives, and here I've been talking more about individual, where in our life as a community are we called not only as Corinthians suggested that when one of our community suffers, we all suffer. In the United States, where rugged individualism means that I'm only concerned about myself and to hell with everybody else, it is in contradiction to the biblical vision. Because the biblical vision says that, well, if somebody is in need, we need to attend to that need. We may not be able to fulfill all of their needs, but we need to somehow make the effort to ensure that what they have is adequate for their flourishing and their prospering. So in terms of the ancient use of the text in Isaiah, or in Jesus' time, He's suggesting, now let me say it this way. He's inviting that community in that small synagogue where everybody knows him. He's inviting them in to now share in the work that he has been sent to accomplish in announcing the great jubilee of God. He's saying every single one of you in that community Every single one of us, whether we're on Zoom or here in person, every single one of us is invited to participate in the work of jubilee making. And the way that that is intended to be is you can't, this is not optional. This is a part of the requirement and obligation of not only believing in God, but understanding who Jesus is. This is not an option. It's a requirement. And we do this 
not to get ourselves saved, not to get our souls to heaven. We do this because this is what God intends for us and the way that we fulfill our humanity. That when we reject the concerns and the needs of the people around us, we reject our humanity. We're less human. Because selfishness is not being human. Selflessness is being human. I know this is hard for some of us to get. And it's definitely hard in the larger world around us right now to get this. When people think that not wearing masks is their right and freedom and act of independence. You see what that says? I don't give two shoots about you. Well, that's not this vision. This vision says that I do what I need to do, not for myself only, but I do what I need to do for the well-being of others. And in being interested and concerned about the well-being of others, I actually end up enhancing my own well-being. You know this. And so the vision here is that God is about, and I think I said this last week, that God is about liberating, setting free, calling into life, creating life, and abounding in kindness and compassion to the nth degree. If that's what the vision of God is that we have, then it has to be that in proclaiming Jubilee, it means that the action of the community and we, the individuals in the community, it means that we have to be engaged in the work of liberating and setting free anyone who is oppressed. It means that we have to be engaged in creating life. And you see, each one of these things, if you think about how it works, the uh, cure the blind. Well, that's not only physical blindness. It might be the blindness created by prejudice and hate and discrimination and fear and anxiety. So Jesus is liberating and setting free not only those who are physically blind, but also the people who are trapped in a world view that isn't enabling them to see the goodness and the grace and the love of God. I had an aunt, I don't know, after a while, you know, when you're old, you don't know if you tell the story and when you told the story, sometimes you tell the story over and over again and everybody smiles uh, and says, oh, that's really nice. We, this is the 15th time we heard this story. So bear with me. A great aunt, wonderful lady, I thought, went to visit her in a, in a care home. Um, and so just off chance, I asked her if she had uh, talked or seen or written to her brother. Her brother lives in California. And I had visited uh, my great aunt and uncle in California. Interestingly enough, they were deaf. Uh, but I knew how to speak uh, cl clear enough that they could read my lips, and I had learned a little sign language uh, to speak to them. Very quickly, she said, I haven't talked to him in 30 years. And I looked at her and I went, what? Why, Auntie, why, why? He didn't pay me back the $8 that he owed me. I went, Auntie, that was probably 50 years ago. Do you think he remembers that? I don't care. He didn't pay me back. I thought she probably went to her grave never having talked to her brother again and holding on to the anger and resentment. How sad that she, she wasn't liberated from that. That she held up. How many people live with regret to the past? Can we change any of the past? No. 
we can change the present so that the future is different. And what we change about the present is letting go of whatever resentment or anger from the past. Or the past could be this morning or last night. You see, the instrument that what Jesus is inviting his community there in Nazareth, where everybody knows him, is to step out of their small world where they are comfortable and into a world where the discomfort could be perceived as a threat to them, but rather the discomfort is going to be an invitation to experience the opportunities for the way in which God will liberate and create life and be agents of compassion for the world that was desperately needed even in the first century of the common era and no less needed for our world today. Let me say this, and uh, Pete, this isn't intended to influence anything that we do at the annual meeting coming up afterwards. But in the last several years, I've become more and more convinced that the work of church, the only work of church that should matter is that we feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick. Why? Because that's when we are most genuinely and authentically following in the way of Jesus the Christ.